Hi everybody, Pastor Brent here and Hannah behind the camera. Uh, good to be with you again. Uh, Premier night, Wednesday night. Some of you watch it Wednesday night. I know the vast majority of you pick it up at some time later. So whenever you're picking this up, it's good to be with you. I have appreciated, and I want to say thank you, uh, some of the dear saints that follow and go here have commented on that they have appreciated uh, some of the things that have been said in the last couple of Bible studies. So that's always a good thing to hear. Double thumbs up, as my grandson would say. And so thank you for that. Uh, the input is, feedback is always good to hear, especially positive feedback. I'm just like everybody else. I love positive feedback. So thank you. Appreciate that. We're going to be continuing in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 today, talking about the God of all comfort and compassion. So we'll get there. But before we do that, uh, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to present the Bible study again. Uh, we just pray that you would just take, help me to take your word, not to dilute it, uh, not to change it, not to confuse it, uh, but to explain it well, to exegete it properly so that people will really be benefited. We live in a time and we know that there's all kinds of distortions of biblical teaching, and I don't want to be one of those guys. So help me not to be that person. I also pray, God, that as we're going to be talking about the God of compassion and the God of all comfort, that those that need that compassion and comfort today, that they will find that. And as they find it for themselves, the Bible tells us to share it with others, to help others in their needs. So God, help us to be those people. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I did a big thing on grace and peace to you. Uh, today, I really want to talk about the God of compassion and the God, Paul says, the God of all. He doesn't just say comfort, but he says all comfort. So that's where we're going to spend uh, most of our time today talking about that, the importance of that in your life, the importance of that in my life as well. So I'm going to read from verse 3 to verse 7. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us, that's awesome, in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. More awesome. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow into our lives, not as awesome, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. More awesome. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. This is particularly applicable from Paul to the Corinthian church, a church that he has an interesting relationship with, and we will discuss that throughout the entirety of the Bible studies that we are doing. Um, again, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about patient endurance when I get there of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings and also Christ's sufferings, so also you share in our comfort and, of course, Christ's comfort. So um, I talked a little bit about this last week in, um, in the Bible study notes, and I've got a fresh set for you for this week, of course, uh, with another uh, world-famous map. Um, but um, I do want to just reiterate the, the whole thought of um, God being there for us when we need Him, but understanding that it's not just for us, but it's when we receive something that we pass it on to somebody else, because that's what the intent of all of this is, that we're not just selfish believers getting everything we can from God, but also that we want to share what we have received from God with other people. Uh, last week in the notes, I talked obviously a great deal about grace and peace, uh, and I touched on Jesus being, uh, you know, the God of all comfort, but never really got into it that much. So we're going to get into it today. God is the God of compassion. God is the God of all comfort. And that is a promise, not just for the Corinthian church, but that's a promise for you. And I talked about compassion last week, about compassion is more than just feeling. It's more than just a feeling. 
It's more than, doesn't mean it isn't, it's just more than, just a feeling. Compassion means that you are inclined to do something. Because of something you feel, hear, or see. So something's going on. You want to do something about it. You want to make a difference. You want to change the situation, the circumstances. That's what compassion. Um, I mentioned Compassion International, that that's an organization that reaches out primarily to kids and helps them. They've actually named their entity Compassion International. I think there might be an arm of that called Compassion Canada. I'm not real sure, but I think maybe, and they help kids. So the whole idea is not just that I feel bad that kids are in poverty, not just that I feel bad that kids don't get an education, um, that they can't have drink, clean drinking water, but I want to do something about it, so I'm going to give money to it. So God is the God of compassion. God is the God that does something about our, our troubling situations. Uh, he is not the God that sits by passively and just watches. Um, some people in their belief about God um, will say, yeah, I believe God exists. I believe he's out there. I believe he put everything into motion. And now I believe that he just leaves us alone and whatever happens, happens. So if Adam and Eve sinned, they sinned. If there's consequences to the sin, that people suffer and die and there's wars and famines and all that, so be it. But God isn't intervening in any way. Um, I don't know how they can hold that view and then talk about Jesus because Jesus, to me, is the ultimate intervention. Uh, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I only do those things which please the Father. Um, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Our sin is the greatest need that we could ever have. Only Jesus could overcome that for us. So to me, that is divine intervention in the extreme. So I don't know how many people are out there that do believe that, yeah, there's a God and he puts everything into motion and he leaves us alone uh, to our own wills, strengths and weaknesses, when Jesus is the biggest gift and intervention there is. So I'm not sure how they reconcile that. I certainly can't reconcile that. So I'm not sure where they're going with that. But to me, it just demonstrates that God is a God of compassion. Um, when <clears throat> Jesus um, shows up, and he heals people, and people are fed, and people that are depressed and discouraged are encouraged and find reason to, to move on. I mean, to me, there's, there's the God of compassion. There's the God of love. Uh, there's the God that cares about his creation, humankind. I mean, uh, he's all about that. So that's important for us. And I don't want you thinking that he is an idle God when you are going through things. I had this conversation um, with some people um, yesterday. Uh, so yesterday would have been Monday. I'm taping Tuesday, so yesterday would have been Monday. But I was having this conversation. Um, we know somebody that um, is a close personal friend, is doing great work for God in Europe, and uh, yet is dealing with prostate cancer. Um, and this is not the first dealing with it, it's the second dealing. And it, it seems like things are maybe even a little bit more serious this time than last time. So we we're having this conversation, some, some friends. And I was saying to, to them, you know what, um, I'm a pastor and I love God with all my heart, soul, mind and strength. And I've read the Bible a bunch of times and I have a reasonable understanding of God, and I want to say that with a lot of humility. I have a reasonable understanding of God through the scriptures that I've read and what I've experienced. I do not have a perfect understanding of God. In the little I know, nor do I know everything I ought to know about God, the width, the height, and the breadth, but I have a reasonable understanding about God and how God works. But I'm always, I'm always 
mystified, curious um, when I see people that are really making a difference for the kingdom of God taken early or get very sick. After I referenced my friend, I mentioned uh, this Pentecostal pastor out in um, Newfoundland who was not only a pastor but also um, a theologian and a Bible college teacher, a podcast host, wrote, wrote books. And um, during COVID, I would listen to his Sunday night broadcast, um, sometimes live, sometimes I would just listen to it later. And he was dealing with a lot of great issues at the time. He was dealing with the closing of churches. He was dealing with the COVID restrictions and masks and vaccines. And in Newfoundland, they had different rules than Ontario and just how that was impacting Christians and as Christ followers, should we follow these things? Are those good things to follow? And so he would talk about that. And he would, and even before COVID, he would talk about all kinds of good things, right? Just really good. I found him to be theologically sound. He had a Pentecostal flavor to him. And he wasn't afraid because he was a podcast guy. Wasn't afraid to raise all the big issues. Um, and so there were hundreds of us that would follow him. And then uh, I knew he was writing a book. I knew he was on a sabbatical writing a book because the PhDs, they got to write books or they got to print material. They got to be out there active. And he took some time off. And so, you know, the podcasts were there, but they weren't as frequent. And then I noticed there, w- there weren't any new ones at all. And then I found out that he was killed in a motorcycle accident. He was a motorcycle guy. And I don't know the story, but he was killed. And I thought again, God, I don't understand. This guy's doing great stuff. He's making a difference for the kingdom. He's a godly influencer, and he's gone. Where's where's the compassion? Where's the wisdom? If I were God, and isn't that a scary thought? You probably just spilled your drink. I wouldn't allow my buddy in Europe to be sick. And I wouldn't allow this guy to be killed in a motorcycle accident because they're making a difference. These people need to be alive. They're making a difference. They're God-centered, God-focused, giving glory to God. Make these people well. Heal these people. Protect these people. Do that, God. Be the God of compassion because what bothers us, right, is when we feel like God is sitting on the sidelines not doing things, especially for people we care about. Now, I realize my thinking is wrong. I realize that thinking is not biblical. I realize that thinking is very human. But I, I think those thoughts sometimes, and I've just given voice to those thoughts. Now, again, I know God knows what he's doing, but sometimes we wonder, we wonder, and I don't have all the answers, folks, but the Bible says that he is, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. So it doesn't matter what I say about what I think. What matters is is what the Word says, and the Word says that He is the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. So I hang on to that truth. I apply that truth to my life. I try to live that truth. I try to believe that truth, have faith in that truth, that that's who He is, that He's someone that does intervene and does get involved. And hey, things do happen. Sometimes bad things happen. Um, We don't know all of the reasons. And for some people, although they're hitting a speed bump now, like my buddy is with his health, that doesn't mean that's the end of the story. He is the God of all compassion, the father of compassion. But the Bible goes on to say is, and you'll see this in your notes, that he is also the God of, as, and I've emphasized this for a reason, because it says it. So if it says it, there's a reason for it. And it just doesn't say that he's the comforting God or he comforts us from time to time. It says that he is the God of all comfort. So I really like that because that's our comfort comes from God. He is that guy. And the Bible says this, and you'll see this in your notes under verse four, who comforts us in all our troubles.
So, any of you out there, show of hands, any of you out there experiencing some trouble? Any of you out there need some comfort? Guess who that is? He is the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Now, I could give you some biblical texts um, from John, and I'll quote it. But the Bible does remind us that, you know, we will experience trouble in the world, whether you want to admit that or not. Um, And of course, there are other passages that say it as well. But let me just read this for you. John 14 and 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me, right? Why? Well, because he is the God of all comfort and compassion. And yes, things are going to happen, but, but be of good cheer, right? Um, there's a place for us. John 16 and 33, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So John 14, 1 and 2, John 16, I think it's 33. Yeah, 33, some verses about uh, trouble. Um, I'll give you maybe one more. I'll give you one more. Uh, You probably know these. uh, If you don't know the exact references, you probably know you probably know um, the books and uh, where they are. Um, let me just make sure. I found the one in James 1, but it doesn't exactly say what I want it to say. Let me just see if there's one that says it any better. Um, Yeah, 1 Peter 1, verse 6, and James 1, James 1, um, just want to make sure I get the right one. Yeah, James 1, verse 2. So 1 Peter 1, verse 6, and James 1, verse 2. Um, they talk about trials and tribulations. So, um, he is the God that comforts us in our troubles. He's the God that comforts us in our trials and tribulations. Um, he's the God that comforts us in our losses and in our discouragements. So, he is that God that, again, he shows up because he's a God of compassion. He shows up and he brings comfort to us. In John 16, the comfort that he brings to us is peace, it says. In John 14, it says that he has a place for us. In in 1 Peter 1 and 6 and James 1 and 2, he, he is the God that helps us to persevere. And so, yeah, you're right. I'm getting a little cutesy here. Peace, place, and perseverance. Three Ps there. So God is just the God of all of comfort. And folks, even in your deepest pain, God is the God of over of, of comfort. Now, to the point where it, it actually, the Bible says his comfort overflows from our life. We've got so much and we've been touched so much that it can flow into somebody else's life. Now, when I use this passage of scripture regularly, I use this passage of scripture regularly in funerals because it's very, it's very appropriate for funerals. So for me to talk to people who are grieving the loss of a loved one, talking about the comfort of God is really important. And um, as much as that's true, that's not the context here. It could be the context. I mean, it's not that people don't die at Corinth, 
but, but that's not why Paul is writing this. Paul has a, a really interesting relationship with the Corinthians, and he's written some letters, two of which we have, and another one or two which maybe we don't have, that are pretty severe, pretty chastising. And his words have offended them. His words have hurt them, even though what he wrote and said needed to be, needed to be written and said. And so I think what he's thinking about is you've been hurt, you've been wounded by what I've written about your conduct. Maybe you've hurt and wounded one another, but God is big enough to comfort us. So I think that's the context. I often use the scriptures, though, to comfort people who have lost a loved one. And if you've lost a loved one, you can appreciate that God is the God, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. If you're at odds with somebody, like Paul is with the Corinthian church, and there is trouble between you and somebody else, it's great that God can comfort you in your trouble with somebody else. But what you will also see the Apostle Paul do in 2 Corinthians is work very hard to restore the relationship that he wants or had with the Corinthians. He wants it to be healthy and strong. And so Paul isn't saying, hey, God's the God of all comfort. And in your losses, you know, when, when people rub you the wrong way or you rub them the wrong way, you don't have to worry about restoring that. God's just going to love you and you'll feel better eventually. That's not what he's saying. He is saying that God is the God of all comfort in any kind of loss that we experience or trouble we experience. But he also shows us through this letter that, hey, work at it. If there's something you can do to restore a broken relationship, then work at it, right? Just don't ask God to console you over a lost relationship. Maybe there's something that you can do to work at it. Had a conversation with somebody on Sunday. Can't tell you the name, can't tell you the, the story. But they were telling me of relationships that were broken that God seems to have healed. And so, hey, there we go. We see that. Um, you may have a family member, a next door neighbor, I don't know, somebody. But, you know, if you work at it, maybe God can restore what's been broken. But regardless of why you need comfort, God is there for us. Promises a place, promises peace, and promises the ability to persevere in the loss. So let me take you back to, to 2 Corinthians again. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, who comforts us in all our troubles, all of them, so that we can what? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received. So th the next part of this, and let me just slide this down a little bit, is to pass it on. Pass on the comfort that you have received to somebody else. It's great that God has comforted you. It's great that God has comforted me. But don't just be a sponge and take it all in for yourself. See if there's a way that you can pass on comfort to somebody else. So let me pause. I don't have, um, don't have a cold bottle, but I do have a cold Coke. And it's halfway time, so it seems like a good time. Um, my wife and my mother-in-law are up north. I will join them shortly. So I'm batching it uh, for a few days. Um, and so um, today for lunch, I had a can of, uh, a can, a processed can of meatball stew two pepperettes and a cheese string. You know, the one you peel. I love those. And for uh, dessert, um, a can of Coke. So I'm eating well. Don't tell Karen. To be honest, folks, um, I love the formed meatball stew. It's not the flavor, although I don't mind it. It's the texture. It just I like the fact that it's not chunks. I like the fact that it's formed little meatballs. So, anyways, uh, 
Maybe Hannah can give us a meatball stew advertisement out of this. That might be the good thing out of this. No, absolutely not. So let me flip the board over. We've got the God of compassion, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who tells us that we ought to comfort others. So what are you doing to comfort others? Now you might say, Pastor Brent, really? Um, I don't really find myself in situations like that very often where I need to do that. But if I do, I remember God's the God of comfort, so that's good. But let me tell you what I think about that. People are in pain and some without hope. And they need to be comforted and they need to hear about Jesus. I realize I'm in a particular profession being a pastor. And so part of my job is to be with people in, in some of their most challenging moments that goes with the territory. But when I think of the new people that come to our church, who they are, I would say about half of them are coming in some kind of pain and need some level of comfort. They are not coming here because they originally felt like I needed Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. They are not necessarily coming here because there's a conviction of sin. Sometimes they have found church or church people to be friendly and they come check us out. Uh, sometimes they're looking for fellowship, maybe a little bit lonely. They're checking us out. Um, they've been invited. They come. They like what they hear and see and feel. They keep coming. Um, and that's some of them. But a, 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 a great number, and I would say around half, and you know, the, when I, it's, that's anecdotal. That's just a number I'm throwing out there for you. But mental health is a big thing. A lot of people coming are just... Uh, don't seem to have a lot of hope. Uh, some people are definitely lonely. Uh, some people have been through loss or rejection, um, some kind of crisis. And um, yeah, we offer them comfort through the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and our perspective as Christ followers. But they're in pain and they're without hope and they want to be comforted. So I would say all of us need to understand that when people are coming to us or coming to our church that they are in pain and they need to be comforted. Um, and so we want to do that. Um, comforted doesn't necessarily mean this. That's the sign that comforted does not equal fix. Sometimes we want to fix people right away. Sometimes we want to like, oh yeah, just do this, this, and this, and I'll fix you. That's no, what we're hoping for is that we can comfort them through the comfort that we have received that has overflowed into our lives. Hopefully we can give them a very good God perspective of what God has done for that. But at first, all you should want to do is just comfort them. You can go deeper eventually. But first, just to me, um, comfort means this, support. Lend some support. It might mean just listening. It might mean giving them a little bit of time every once in a while, looking for them when they come through the church doors, taking them out for coffee, whatever. Um, just support, giving them some tangible support. It doesn't mean, hey, you've come to Essex Gospel and we can fix you in five minutes and send you out the door. Um, that's not what we're looking at. Of course, we want to point people to Jesus Jesus is the one that is bringing us the compassion and Jesus is the one bringing us um, the comfort. But we're not trying to like fix people right away. We're trying to show them some love, give them some hope, support them in their pain, point them to God saying there's a God that loves you and cares for you. There's a savior that died on the cross for you. You may not feel like a sinner and you need a savior, but, but you need Jesus. You, you do need him in your life. You need God to fix you body, soul, mind, and, and spirit. So support, just support. And, and if I could equ equate support with this, 
Lots of arrows. Just taking an interest in them. Uh, so many people are ignored these days, um, especially those on the margins. Um, when you got somebody standing at a stop sign asking for money, panhandling, you wish you, you know, you might roll up your window, you might lock your door, but you also wish you had a, a blind that could come down the side of your window on your car so that you wouldn't even have to look at them. You don't want to be reminded of their pain. You don't want to be reminded of their poverty. You might feel like they're just slacking, but there's all kinds of things. There's certain shows you won't watch because you don't, or maybe even the news, because you don't want to be reminded of people's pain and their suffering and all of that. But we can't hide from that. We've got to support people that are in pain and suffering. We've got to support them and show interest. We've got to point them to a God that loves them. I'm not trying to fix everybody in the first five minutes, but support and interest. The Bible says that we can comfort others in their troubles with the comfort we have received. So you start off with your story that, hey, this is what God did for me, or this is what God did for somebody that I'm close to. Here's the God story. This is how God showed them compassion and God showed them comfort. This is what I can do for you. I can tell you my story, show you how God showed up, show you how I got support, and again, breathe some hope into them. Because God has done something in you. God will continue to do something in you when you do know what it's like to have the comfort. Bible says in verse 4, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So hey, it, it, true, it's great that we've learned. It's great that we know that God has comforted us. That's great, but we're not just a sponge soaking it in. We're going to take that sponge, we're that sponge, we're going to squeeze it out, and we're going to let that flow into the lives of others and say, hey, God did this for me. My story's not the same as yours. My pain's not the same as yours. It's not identical, but you're in pain and I was in pain and I received comfort from God and then you can squeeze you, that sponge, into their lives and let them receive some of the comfort that you have received. You are going to be the conduit between them and God, especially for those that don't know the Lord. They may not know much about God right now. They may not know that they need a savior, but you are that conduit of God's compassion and comfort because what you have received you are passing on to them the knowledge and the help and the health you are passing it on to them and then somewhere down the road the whole idea of being fixed they might say this you know what you talked about god being very personal and helping you directly and you experienced his love and his support and and, and god touched and changed your life I'd like to know more about that God. And then you become, again, the conduit now, not just of comfort, but the conduit of gospel, the conduit of hope. And what we're interested in doing is, is just making Jesus known and giving them an opportunity to decide for themselves if they want to follow God. So we've received help. We pass that on. The Bible says this is true of, of all of us as Christ followers. Verse 5, for just as the sufferings of Christ overflow into our lives or flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. There's no question you know this theologically, that because you're a Christ follower, you will su sometimes suffer for Jesus Christ. But just as the sufferings of Christ flow into your lives because you're a Christ follower, so also his comfort flows. So, for just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. And so we want that. We want that to overflow and touch the lives of others. Again, some people are just looking more for practical help at first rather than salvation and forgiveness of sins. They're looking for hope. They're looking for food. They're looking for opportunity. They're looking for somebody to show an interest in them. That is their primary concern. And so all of that is there for you in verses 3, 4, and 5 of 2 Corinthians 1 of how you can be a blessing to them. Now, verse 6 goes on, and this is where I said the application is different. Paul says this, look, if we're distressed, meaning him and his followers, him and his close buddies, if we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. So Paul says this, um, sometimes making your life better so that you can enjoy the comfort and peace of God 
makes our lives more challenging. Let me give an example of this to you. Um, my dad worked in a smelter at Inco for about 35 years. And he worked over hot furnaces with metals of well over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Was burnt by some of that hot metal, had a steel bar go through his leg once, terrible stuff. But there was always gas that when back in the good old days and you used to travel to Sudbury, you could taste the sulfur from the air. It would go up the smokestack and out. You could taste the sulfur, killed the vegetation and all of that around Sudbury for years until they did a, a reforestation um, project and they just changed the way they, they smelt these days. It's just different. It doesn't pollute the environment. But my dad worked in that gas for over 30 years. Dad loved to tell stories about the people at work. He would talk about the job from time to time. But he loved to talk about the people, the personalities. And there were lively personalities, interesting personalities. But one thing he said to me, he said, Brent, he said, I went to that job because I wasn't really qualified to do anything else. And I worked that job for 30 years because I had a wife and a family to take care of. I didn't do it because it was fun. I did it because it was necessary. And you might say, well, he could have done something else. True. The idea, the point is this. He worked at hard at a really tough job to take care of his family. In other words, he was distressed. He was uncomfortable. He was inconvenienced. Sometimes his life even put in danger in order to take care of his wife and, and the kids. So sometimes people are more than just inconvenienced to help somebody else. People have sacrificed for you. You may know what it's like to sacrifice for others. People talk about working hard so my kids could get a college education so that they wouldn't have to do the same things I did, right? You sacrifice for them or for your grandkids. We understand that. Paul says, look, verse 6, if we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. Paul is saying, look, I'm going through the rigors of sharing the gospel. I'm dealing with all kinds of church issues, the Roman government issues, Greeks that are giving me a hard time, Jews that are giving me a hard time, because I want you to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want you to be comforted. I want you to know the God of all compassion. I want you to experience his salvation. All of that is being said in verse 6. And then he says this, And if you are comforted, and if you are saved and ser serving God, then he says, I am comforted. We are comforted. It was worth it. My dad would have said this, Hey, tough job, went through some really tough times, got injured even, put my life at risk pretty much every day I showed up. But it blessed my wife. It blessed my kids. They had a roof over their head. They had hot food in their stomach. They had good clothes on their back. They got a decent education and were able to make something out of themselves. So he was distressed by going to work and providing for them, but he was also comforted by seeing what he was able to provide for them, what he and my mom were able to provide for the family as a couple, and the fact that they have gone on to make good with the rest of their lives. So Paul says, look, we've been distressed. Me and my buddies have been distressed working hard for you. And we've wondered sometimes if it was ever going to bear fruit, but we've seen that you've been comforted. We've seen that you've received Christ's salvation. And that brings us comfort. It's all about saying this, and it was worth it all. And I'm sure Paul would say, I'd do it again. So we're going to stop there. I hope it was worth it all. Lord willing, we're going to do this again too. We're going to pick it up in verse 7 and talk a little bit about Paul's very interesting relationship with the Corinthian church. I would almost say sometimes love, hate. Uh, not so much Paul with them, but them with Paul. So we'll pick that up next week. We'll see you then. Bye for now.